On this episode of This Week in Linux, we'll check out a bunch of release notes from all kinds of different projects like GNOME 328, Firefox 59, HexChat, and some distros like MX Linux, Netrunner, LibreELEC, Sparky Linux, and more. There's a new Raspberry Pi that was released this week, and we'll dive into that. Private Internet Access VPN service made a major announcement this week about going open source, so we're definitely going to talk about that one. And all, all that and much more coming up. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital, and this is your weekly source for Linux good news. Up first in the show this week is GNOME 328 was released, and there's a lot of new things, mostly bug fixes and feature additions to various different packages and applications in the suite, but there are a lot of interesting GNOME shell specific things as well. So the first thing is that the Nautilus file manager is going gonna, is gonna to have ability to do favoriting, so you can like star files and folders so they can easy access. That's interesting. I, I don't think I've ever seen a file manager do that before, but it's a really interesting approach. So I'm, I'm curious how that would work out. They've also made improvements to various applications like the calendar and context apps, and they've improved support for Thunderbolt 3 and Bluetooth devices. The Bluetooth devices actually makes it really cool because gamers can now have PlayStation 3 and 4 controllers have better support in the GNOME shell environment thanks to those updates. They've also made some updates to Boxes, which is the virtual machine so, uh, solution that that GNOME creates, and they've and one of the things, the, one of the most important things they added for that is the ability to transfer files between the host and the guest. Now, now you can do it with like a send files thing, but you can also do it now with drag and drop, so you can just drag files from the host to the guest and vice versa. GNOME Photos also had some I updates where they added some editing tools, editing the shadows and highlights of an image, as well as doing like some cropping stuff like that. Mostly basics, but the shadows and highlights is an interesting approach too. They've also added a new on-screen keyboard. And the thing that I like about this is the on-screen keyboard has like an automatic activation thing when you have touch-enabled devices. If you touch into a text field or a text area box or something like that where you can type, if you just click into it with your mouse, it'll use your keyboard and ignore the on-screen. But if you touch into it with the touchscreen, it will open the on-screen display thing. And then that way you can have it like just keep using the touch. They've One of the things I, re I really like about this is that they added a like a built-in bandwidth metering tool so that you can have network usage in the background be halted by gnome now it doesn't really affect on it doesn't affect everything but it has a, a lot of effects like being able to dis like to disallow auto updates so in case you have like an issue where certain times you don't have like a good connection you can just dis you can activate this toggle and it won't use the auto updates anymore so that's interesting they've also added something that's I'm not really sure the how useful this is but let me know if you if you think it is there's they've added a new gesture like a secondary click gesture for the touchpads where if you hold your finger on the touchpad and then you use another finger to tap the touchpad it acts as like a right click so if you don't have a right click on your t on your laptop or something like that you can just hold uh, you know put one finger down use the other finger and open it so i guess that's more now that i think about it this might just be one handed so if you just use one finger and then another finger on the same hand, I've convinced myself I like that. <laughs> Next up is a really interesting application. They just called it's called Usage, and it's a perform it's an experimental performance application that's like system performance and things like that. They're keeping the GNOME system monitor, so you're not losing that. It's just more like a very nice visually enhanced version of the same type of pro of program. So. That's interesting. And a little bit of some bad news. The Nautilus 328 is the particular version where desktop icons will be removed. So if you update to Nautilus 328, that will be that that feature will be removed. I actually don't really use desktop icons, so it wouldn't affect me necessarily, but uh, I know, I realize it would affect a lot of people. Uh, and Ubuntu has also realized that, and that's why 18.04 for Ubuntu will ship with GNOME 3.28, but will ship with Nautilus 3.26 to keep support for desktop icons. So if you're a fan of desktop icons, that's good news for you. This week had a release for the Raspberry Pi 3 model B+. This particular release was made on Pi Day, naturally, which is March 14th, if you're not aware. 
this one actually is, is a, an iterative release, but it's got a lot of interesting features. So it, it's the, the, the Pi 3 Model B Plus is the newer version of the Mod Pi 3, but it's added some really useful upgrades to a lot of things. So for example, the, the processor is a 1.4 gigahertz quad-core ARM, and it used to be a 1.2 gigahertz, so it's, it's faster. It doesn't seem like a, much, but it is significantly faster. They've also replaced the 100 megabit Ethernet jack with a gigabit Ethernet jack. So that's great. Although it is still using the USB 2.0 bus instead of 3.0. It has limitations where, they're, depending on the scenario of what you're doing, that could be a negative, but still it's much better than the previous version. They've also added dual band 802.11 AC Wi-Fi support. So you can have both the 2.5 gigahertz and the 5 gigahertz. So if you need to have devices connected on both bands, you can, which is great. They've improved mass storage booting with USB, as well as improved thermal management. So the thermal, thermal management improvements allows you to have like higher sustained performance for longer periods of time without having to worry about it overheating. Because of the, the more, like the more uh, powerful processor and the more uh, powerful gigabit Ethernet, they've also, they've, it's kind of increased the power consumption, but not a, not a significant amount, but enough where you need to get a 2.5 amp power supply in order to sustain it properly. Because you used to be able to use like a, a less powerful one, but now you pretty much need to use a 2.5. But anyway, the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus is still going to be the $35. So it's still a great price, and I look forward to, try, to trying it out. I actually haven't tried the Pi 3 anyway, so I'm kind of glad I waited to get this one just because I already have a couple older Pis, but the Gigabit Ethernet is definitely worth it in my opinion. So I will be checking it out pretty soon. Next up in the show is Firefox 59 was released this week, as well as a snap for Firefox 59. Firefox 59 adds some interesting new updates, but it's mostly like an iterative release. They've added support for decentralized internet protocols, which is pretty cool, like IPFS or DAT or Secure Scuttlebutt, which is just fun to say anyway. And But they've also added some nice anti-nagging issues, I guess, because constantly get asked on websites, would you like to enable push notifications? No, I would not like to enable push notifications for a random website every single time something like it's just so anyway yeah firefox has added support for you to turn those off thank you and not only is it that they're gonna the 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 notifications or the pop-ups that ask you for your camera your microphone your location notifications and more those will be able to be disabled because most of the time they're irritating to be asked because most of the time you don't you would never want them to be asked and they and so many ask for it Especially the location one. That is weird that so many websites ask for location and vast majority of them have no reason to ask. Like a blog asking for my location. Why? Anyway, we also got information about the, the Firefox Snap that is now available. And the Snap is um, essentially like the same thing that Firefox is. There are a few, some, there are some few theming issues um, that you might expect because of the, the theming issues with Snaps. But there's uh, some people who have posted some misleading information about the Firefox Snap being really heavy, saying that it's 193 megabytes, which, yeah, it is 193 megabytes. However, when you download a compressed file that's a dev file or a tarball and you have to uncompress it or when you install it, the final installed version would be roughly like 180 to 185. So the difference between the two is actually not as much as people are making it out to be. Mozilla is working on a flat pack version of Firefox as well. They're just, they just said that there's apparently some issues that they haven't been able to release it yet, but they haven't disclosed what those are yet, but they are working on it. So if you're a fan of flat packs, that's coming too. We got some great news from the Private Internet Access, or PIA, and the, the VPN company. They have announced that they're going to go completely open source. So over the next six months, they'll be releasing the source code for all of their client-side applications, as well as the libraries and extensions for those applications. So far, they've only released the Chrome extension, but they said more are co will coming, be coming soon. If you're not familiar with Private Internet Access it's or what, it, what they do, it's a VPN or virtual private network that allows you to have have a little bit more privacy online. VPNs themselves are not ultimate privacy or ultimate security or anything like that. It's just they add an extra layer of, of privacy and security. But they, they also are very involved in the free and open source software community. 
So because they're they're supporters of like of KDE, Gnome Gnome, Inkscape, Let's Encrypt, and many others like Linux Mint and stuff like that. They've also not only are they su- like supporters of Freenode, they decided to just outright purchase Freenode. So they are not just supporters; they're like controlling entity of Freenode, and, and they continue to provide everything that's great about Freenode. So that's that's awesome. The, the fact that they're supporting open source software and now they're going to be releasing their software as open source, that is great news. And if you like, there is a link in the video description for private internet access if you'd like to sign up for it. The link is an affiliate link that gives credit to this show, or really this channel, Tux Digital, and lets us get a little bit of commission. So if you want, if you do decide to purchase private internet access service, you know, consider using the affiliate link down below. Also, later in the show, there is some... VPN security woes that private internet access is not involved in. So that's good to know. Up next in the show is HexChat. 2.14.0 was released this week. It's the first release of HexChat since October of 2016. Been quite a while, and they go into the, the blog post explains why it's taken as long as they as it has. They've decided to rewrite a lot of the build system into to using Mason as well as adding some different build, build packages. They've added support for Flatpak and Snaps, as well as adding support for the Windows Store. They decided that the Flatpak is the one they recommend to use, so if you're interested in checking out the latest version of HexChat, then they suggest to use the Flatpak, even though there, there is option for both. They think that the Flatpak is better because... Well, they didn't really give exactly a reason. They just said it's harder to build or it's more difficult to make snaps, but they didn't really say why. Other programs developers consider the like the reverse true for them. So I would be really interested to know like in more details of why any individual developer picks either one of the formats because I'm you know it'd be really interesting to know. Also, they've one of the things that I've kind of been annoyed by for a very long time about HexChat is the icon in the system tray. Let's say you had a monochrome theme. When you activate HexChat, your icon in the system tray would be like really off-putting because it's like it's very colorful. And they've now added a feature so that you can have custom icons so you can like make a monochrome version of the HexChat icon if you'd like to. So that is great. So anyway, HexChat 2.14.0. Up next in the show is Lector. Lector is a cute based ebook reader for Linux, the Linux desktop. It provides basically like a nice visual way to consume ebook instead of just like a basic PDF form. It has like uh, theming colorization so you can choose like how you want to read it, like what's best for your eyes, whether you like a dark mode, uh, a light mode, or like a sepia based, something like that. You can choose like what, what kind of theming you would like to use. They've also added in this newest version, preliminary PDF support. So if you do like to use PDFs, you can do so in this with it rather than just like EPUB files. They've also added a lot of bug fixes and GUI improvements and a new icon theme. The thing they, they talk about the most is that the, there's better caching of images for comics. They've decided to call this particular improvement the ludicrous speed, which I appreciate. If you're, if you're interested in checking out Elector, it's uh, not very easy to install on Ubuntu yet because it is uh, doesn't have a PPA at the moment, so you'd have to compile it yourself. But still, I think it was interesting and worth enough to merit be on the show. So, Elector ebook reader. Next up in the show is L Player, which is a minimal audio player for Linux. L Player is not necessarily a music player, but it, it can be a music player, but it doesn't have like all the features that a normal music player you would, would you expect with but it does have a lot of interesting features that are more applicable to like audiobooks and podcasts and things like that so uh, if you're interested in having something for that this is a good solution to check out they have a very minimal ui as you can tell but they they also have the ability to save the playback position for each track individually so that if you want to stop listening to something like long form content like an audiobook or a podcast you can always go back to it and resume where you were. So that's fantastic. And another nice feature of audiobooks and podcast players that I would prefer for you know any type of consumption for those types of formats is the ability to adjust the playback speed so I can increase it so it plays faster. And this does have the ability to do that as well. So it has potential to be a decent audiobook and podcast player, even though that might not be its specific purpose. So if you're interested in checking it out, you can find a link in the show notes below. 
Kexi 3.1 was released this week, and Kexi is a alternative to Microsoft Access built in the Caligra suite. So it allows you to do like design tables, queries, forms, build database applications, it's like export the data for various different purposes in various different formats. So it's it's kind of it's basically an alternative to Microsoft Access, which is a database application. Kexi also offers rich data search option, searching options as well as a parameterized queries and storing objects like images directly in the in the database data. So what's really cool about this particular version is that this is the first version where Kexi has now become not only a, a application for Linux and Mac, it now has support for Windows. So it could be used as a a tool to convince people to try out alternatives and maybe even gradually move them over to Linux. So that's always good to see. Up next in the show is FEH Fe. Is it Fe? I don't know. <laughs> it's an image viewer that is terminal based or command line based. So this is a pretty cool. Like the, the actual updates that they have for this particular version are not that really that much of a difference. They're just mostly like improvements or maintenance improvements. But I wanted to talk about it because this is a very interesting application I just recently found out that existed. It allows you to do like viewing images in a slideshow a montage mode, a multi-window mode, which the multi-window mode is just like loads each image into its own window, but it uses like an X server display window. So the only thing in the window is the image itself. So it's a very minimal approach to an image viewer. So if you want to use, uh, you know, you want a command line solution for this, or maybe even a scriptable solution for this, this is pretty interesting application to check out. Uh, they also have another feature where it's uh, it's called a list view. It's more of like an info informational view. It lists the, the information of the images. If you're interested, check it out and let me know what you think. The FE terminal based image viewer. This week we got some news from the Linux Mint team for improving the app speed of launching or the app launching speed of applications in Cinnamon. They've said that they've committed backports of two upstream commits from the GNOME team. There's it's using for their to improve their muffin library, which is a fork of Mutter, which is the window manager for the Cinnamon stack. They've also added four commits to Cinnamon that they were able to speed up the window list and panel launchers. So if you if you'd like to learn more about the like actual specifics of what they're like the blog posting describes what they were going through trying to figure out why was it slower on Cinnamon versus XFC or Mate, for example. The the blog post goes into details about how they were looking to see what the differences were, how they decided to fix them, and what what exactly they did to fix them. So if you're interested in checking that out, check out the link in the show notes. Up next in the show is i3 version 4.15 was released this week. The updates for this are mainly just improvements of features and bug fixes and things like that. But the the one of the things I like is that they have most notable thing, not no, mo- most notable, but the fact that they put it up front is very important, is that documentation improvements have been done. And documentation is one of those, it's one of those topics that is not really cool to talk about to address as a project. And uh, I'm also at fault of that, of not keeping up to pro- documentation enough on some of my stuff. It's nice to see when pe- when projects do that. They've also added some interesting features to the i3 editor and terminal capabilities, as well as made it so that you can now use the swap command to work with full screen windows. And also a wide range of bug fixes. So if you're an i3 user, you should, they, they should recommend that you definitely upgrade to the latest version. In distro news this week, MX Linux 17.1 was released. This is a, a point release that adds some nice features and, up, and upgrades to the system. They have up- updated the Linux kernel to 4.15, and they've made a auto-update option for the MX updater so you can do uh, unattended upgrades. So that's pretty cool. They've also added the ability to have config options in the MX tweak tool so you can reset various like custom actions and stuff like that to defaults. So if you change something and you, you decide you don't really want any, anymore, you can just reset them all and go right back back. So that's really nice. Uh, one of the things I like about the MX is that they, they listen to the community a lot. So if you have, if you have a, a complaint or whatever at a forum, they'll, they, they address it in most cases. And in this one particular case, they had ability in Thunar so you could use custom actions to do root level actions, but not necessarily always be root at the time. So it was like a, it's like a, a weird timing system where if you activated root and then you go change something, it might not always ask for it. And that was con- like looked at as a negative side effect to that 
that setting. They have addressed that, so the latest version of 17.1 will always ask for a password prompt for all root level actions inside of Thunar when you try to adjust anything in root. So that is really cool. So if you're interested in checking out a really nice polished Debian based distro, check out MX Linux. Up next in the show is Libre Elec has released the 8.2.4 ISO for the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus that we mentioned earlier in the show. The Libre Elec distribution is an operating system for the Kodi Media Center. If you've not heard of Kodi, Kodi is a fantastic media center for uh, basically making your own home theater system type thing. It's it's a really good thing, and this provides like and Kodi works on like pretty much every operating system. However, Libre Elec is a operating system specifically for Kodi. So you can run it on a Pi, you can run it on like a wide variety of devices, really. Or you can have like an, a, a set-top box appliance with it as well, if you'd like. LibreELEC is, is actually a fork of an, another version that some people might be aware of called OpenELEC. I like LibreELEC a lot more because they are much faster to make updates and make releases and things, and they're much more uh, engaging with the community as well. So, for example, OpenELEC hasn't had a new, hasn't had an update since June of last year. And the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B Plus was released this week, and the same day, LibreElec released their ISO for it. So that is the kind of reactionary time that I, I like to see. If you haven't checked it out before, definitely do so. Kodi is fantastic, and LibreElec is just enough OS for Kodi. Up next in the show is Sparky Linux 5.3 was released this week. The Spark Linux 5.3 is a Debian-based distribution that's based on Debian Buster or Debian testing. They added, updated the graphical installer to Calamares 3.1.12 and has added support for ButterFS and XFS file systems, which is pretty cool because both of those provide snapshot ability. ButterFS also has copy on write, so you can check that out if, you, if you'd like to. They've also added BleachBit as a default application for Sparky Linux for 5.3. And if you're interested, check out the show notes. You can have you can try out Sparky Linux with LXQt, Mate, XFCE, and OpenBox editions. So Sparky Linux 5.3. Neptune 5 was released this week. Neptune has switched their distribution to Debian Stable, the stretch version. And they have up, they've updated Plasma for KDE Plasma to KDE Plasma 5.12. They've decided to not offer up-to-date apps, like not trying to keep pace with all the latest applications. They're more of a stable-based distro because they said that they, they recommend people use Snap, Flatpak, and App Images to do it because that because a lot of developers are now using one of at least one of those formats. So like it's interesting that d distros are now able to take that stance as just being a stable based rather than trying to keep up with everything. They've improved their artwork, so they have their own custom theme and icons. But there was one thing that they decided to do in this latest version that is, is interesting. They don't make it easy to install proprietary graphics drivers. They it's still possible because it's it's because it's based on Debian, you can still use the Debian tools to do so. But they have decided to remove their easy installation process of doing so. So that's kind of interesting. I'm not really sure how that would work out for them. But you know, if you're interested in checking out Neptune 5, you can find a link in the show notes. Netrunner 18.3 Idolon, Idolon was released this week. And Netrunner is a both a, a rolling, rolling release distribution and a stable release distribution. The stable release is the one that has the update for this particular news. And this one has uh, Plasma 5.12.2. It's been updated to the, the Linux 4.14 LTS kernel. The Netrunner Stable Edition is based on Debian testing. And it's, it's similar to the way that Neptune is based on Debian, though the Neptune even uses a little bit of Netrunner's packages. But Netrunner is both Debian-based and Arch-based, although not necessarily Arch-based there because they're, they're based on Manjaro. Sort of Arch-based, but not exactly. It's not, it's not like directly on Arch. But they've added some, some interesting updates that they've brought this Plasma Discover back to the desktop, which is really nice to see because the latest versions of Plasma Discover have been very much improved. They've decided to also set up a new streaming media, music player called Yurok, which I have tried it a little bit. And um, I'm not, I, have, I haven't put much experience in of Yurok, but so far 
it's got it's got a lot of good ideas, although sometimes it's not necessarily like how I would want it to be used. So if you have tried Uroc, please let me know in the comments below. And they've also added the updates to the system settings to make them more streamlined. And they've improved some of the layouts of the system settings, like creating a plasma tweak. One of the things that I don't really like about the system settings is that it's kind of scattered, not really well organized in some cases, and it looks like the Netrunner team has decided to improve some of that. So that is pretty cool to see. Netrunner 18.03. Up next in the show is the Canonical Corner, or the place where all the Ubuntu news goes. So we, the weekly update news, there was, really, there was a lot of information about really nice features and fixes that are going upstream to the GNOME team. So, for example, they've pushed some touch, uh, touchpad fixes to GNOME as well as proposed even more touchpad improvements via lib input. So that is really nice to see. And they've also updated versions of Mutter and the GNOME shell to the 1804 Bionic through a, like a feature freeze exception. So that guarantees that 1804 will be shipping with GNOME 328. So that's nice to see. Although, to, be, to reiterate from the previous mention, the Nautilus will still be 326 for the desktop icons feature. What's really interesting about this particular news this week for the from the Ubuntu Desktop Weekly update is that we've got some updates for support of themes and Snap applications. They are currently working on improving that throughout both GTK and Qt. It's likely that the GTK will be the GTK themes will be supported prior to Qt, but they are working on both. And that's nice to see. So like one of the biggest complaints that people have about snaps is the theming. So it's really, really nice to see when that like they're gonna actually address this now. Also this week they announced in a podcast on the Ubuntu podcast that the Ubuntu 1804 will not include the new GTK theme. It's unfortunate, but it makes sense considering it's in an LTS. They want to make sure all the bugs are you know squashed as much as possible before they release before they release it, and they just don't think it's ready for that for an LTS release. So 18.10 will likely be the version that they released the new theme. They've also updated the minimal image for Ubuntu. So, you can, so the, the total size of the minimal image of Ubuntu installation is 28 megabytes. Now, this is I'm mentioning this because the minimal image and the minimal installation are two different things. One is the image for the ISO for like building your own distro based on Ubuntu kind of thing. The minimal installation is the feature that they've added to 18.04 that you can remove applications that you don't necessarily need. So Canonical, you need to like work on your naming scheme because it's a little confusing. What, another really cool thing that I want to talk about is that they announced that there's possibility that the ZST decompression algorithm that Facebook made could improve the installations of Ubuntu in future releases. So they are considering making experimental support for the 1804 release but it won't be, you know, it won't definitely won't be at a default. But it is possible that they'll have it default for 18.10 so that the installations will be much faster, roughly about 10% or so for when you install the app for when you install the operating system. So that is pretty cool to see. And I would definitely like to see some benchmarks on that when it does happen. Ubuntu 18.04 is looking really nice, especially and all, all especially the fact that all the flavors are having such you know massive changes and impacts getting ready for the release. So I can't wait, and I will probably talk about it again for every week until it actually ships. <laughs> so, Next up in the show is Purism announced they've got initial enablement of Plasma Mobile on the Librem 5 test boards or development boards. This is pretty cool. This blog post shows them working with the Plasma 5 development to get the Plasma Mobile to get development to get it to work on the Librem 5. The default is still going to be the GNOME mobile thing that they're working on. Purism is working on the mobile version of GNOME to run on their device. So they're still working on the default. Not totally sure why they're still picking something that doesn't exist yet because they have to build it themselves, but hey, that's their thing and uh, best of luck to them. It is cool to get the information that Plasma Mobile is currently working on the development boards. And they've also announced that they're going to be uh, going to Zenshin to meet with uh, potential suppliers for creating the Librem 5, which is supposedly coming next year. So it's nice to see that they're already working on the getting supplies and stuff. So it does look like it might be possible that they might be on time. Best of luck to them for that, and I hope they are. I, I can't wait to play with the Librem 5. 
Up next in the show is Let's Encrypt. They actually announced a really cool feature. And it's the Acme is their protocol. The version two of the protocol is really nice to see because they've been listening to feedback from the like industry experts and organizations that have or maybe be potentially considering using the protocol. It's re- the reason I, I think it's cool is because the wildcard certificate support. Wildcard, wildcard certificate solves one of the biggest problems of certificate deployment in that if you have a domain and you need a certain SSL cert to get to make that to make HTTPS correct like work if you have multiple subdomains you need multiple certifications or certificates for each subdomain well you need multiples for the domain so you can have one for every subdomain and that's pretty complicated to keep track of all these things but the wildcard certificate allows you to have one certificate that has a wildcard system that all subdomains can utilize that single certificate. That is awesome. And they're still saying people should use the non-wildcards right now because it's like the first version, but it shows a lot of potential for you know ease of use as far as managing different certificates. Instead of having so many for one domain and through the subdomains, you can have one that does everything. That has a lot of potential. It removes the barrier to entry. So that is fantastic to see. This week we got an, an, an information about some vulnerabilities that are inside of three popular VPN services. This was this article came from the hackernews.com website and they talk about the probably the worst possible thing that could happen with a VPN is that your IP, your original real IP address is being leaked outside of the VPN depending on the configurations and stuff. So this uh, Pretty much applies to browser plugins, mostly Chrome, but this is something that should never happen with a VPN. So even it happened, regardless of how it happens, not a good thing. So this applies to Hotspot Shield, Pure VPN, and ZenMate. All all these services are leaking the real IP addresses, which you know can identify an individual user, their IP, their actual location with a very you know with a reasonable amount of distance, like 20 miles or so. And depending on if they contact who the company is, that may or may not get even more details. So it kind of defeats one of the key reasons to use VPN if it's leaking the IP, the real IP of the VPN, I mean of the user. Good news, though, is that Hotspot Shield has apparently fixed the vulnerabilities. However, ZenMate and PureVPN have not addressed the vulnerabilities yet. So, well, and actually PureVPN is is a service that people should pretty much avoid anyway because they have are known for lying about their policies. They they said that they have a no logging policy of people who use their services, although they came out a few months ago and admitted that they do log the services and IPs and stuff. So they completely lied about that. And also like when you go to their website, they're lying to you immediately when you go to like the live chat. They they pretend to base the live chat names and representatives to whatever country you're in instead of just using the actual people's names. So like that by itself is like you're supposed to, like your entire service is based on trust, yet you're lying the moment you talk to them. Like, eh, gonna have to go with no. No thank you. Private Internet Access does exist, and we know for a fact that they don't have logs of their, uh, you know, they don't. They, they have a no log policy, and they stick to it, and they also support the community in a massive way. So even though these three are potentially not good options, we do have a really good option in Private Internet Access, so... Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, we have a Patreon at tuxdigital.com slash Patreon, or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to tuxdigital.com slash Linux is Everywhere, or to type less, tuxdigital.com slash shirt. Just a reminder, the show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with Tux Digital. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux.